All right, let's get started. This will be the last session of our conference. I want to thank everybody for the interesting talks we've heard so far. And we have six more presenters today. So we'd like to give them our full attention. Um, I'm pleased to announce the uh, first speaker, Jorge Iniguez from uh, Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology and also the University of Luxembourg. So I'll give you a warning after 20 minutes. Perfect. And you'll have five minutes more and then another five for questions. Fantastic. OK, so good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, showing up. Uh, I must confess that yesterday probably had one beer too many. So I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to be doing uh, in the, with the flow of ideas in the talk. And it's also work that uh, we haven't published and I am presenting for the first time. Actually, we have not presented all any of this in any conference. So of course, the first time you talk about something is a little bit more bumpy. But anyway, so I want to tell you essentially two stories. One is more general about uh, things that we are trying to do to discover new antiferroelectric materials or materials I'm going to call Kittel antiferroelectrics, you will see why. And the second one is more specific, is about uh, a specific investigation of a, a few of those materials that we were uh, uh, studying, among many others, for which we already found something promising. Uh, uh, all the work is been, has been done by uh, Ugo Ramberry, who is a postdoc uh, with me working in Luxembourg, and we also have benefit from benefited from interactions with Enrique Canadel, who is a very good uh, quantum chemist in Barcelona. OK, first of all, let me just say, it's, uh, uh, first principles methods are what we do. Um, nothing uh, about the simulation seems special. Everything is very standard. Uh, density functional theory, the usual uh, GGA approximation, PBE sol, VASP. So there is nothing to remark here. Uh, and we believe that for the properties that we are going to be discussing here, DFT is generally quite accurate. Uh, we have experience for that. OK, so one, one slide of introduction about antiferroelectrics. So I am bringing this up uh, to, to give you the classic definition in the literature. I don't want to go uh, 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 to spend much time about this. There are some controversies about uh, certain cases, whether we should call antiferroelectric or not, or, or to what extent it's possible to define uh, from a symmetry point of view what an antiferroelectric is. I'm not interested in that right now. What I'm interested in uh, is to just remind you that in a very naive way, in Kittel's, uh, in, in the uh, founding paper of the field by Charles Kittel, uh, he essentially was defining antiferroelectrics in analogy with antiferromagnets. So essentially, you would have, if this is one of our perovskites, let's say that the atom here in the middle, which could be titanium, if this was barium titanate, moves to the left. That kind of movement I can express with uh, like a lo local electric dipole with an arrow. So in antiferroelectric, you would have this kind of movement in antiphase from cell to cell. Okay, while in a ferroelectric phase of the same material, you would have the same movement, but always in phase from cell to cell. Okay, so in an ideal antiferroelectric material, it would be one in which these two states exist. They are metastable, uh, separate, uh, and they are very close in energy. And they are also closely related in nature because they are exactly the same thing at the local level. The only thing that changes is the, is the modulation. So when you have an antiferroelectric like that, you typically expect two things to happen. At the phase transition, you are going to see some sort of anomaly of the dielectric susceptibility, which couples to this order, of course, not this one. But since they are essentially the same thing, when you are softening your antiferroelectric order, you are softening your ferroelectric order as well. And you see the dielectric susceptibility to have uh, very large values, as here measured in let's circle 9. And you also expect to have a double hysteresis loop like this, because again, the orders are very close in energy. So with an electric field, you should typically be able to switch from this one to this one. And that's what you see here, again, for, for let's circulate. So OK. So in this talk, I'm going to be inter There could be other materials that don't follow some of these uh, 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 characteristics so closely. And you could still call antiferroelectrics. But in this talk, I'm going to be interested in what I'm calling Kittel antiferroelectrics, which are defined essentially by an analogy with antiferromagnets. And they, they are like this. OK. So then you could ask a question. Um, um, uh, are there Kittel antiferroelectrics among perovskites? Or can we induce in a perovskite this kind of antiferroelectricity? And um, um, a, a very powerful, uh, um, uh, oh, this shouldn't have appeared here. Well, yeah. A very powerful theoretical tool that we have to analyze uh, uh, in stability, so possible structural phase that you can have in any material, in particular in a perovskite, is to look, to consider in the simulation the high symmetry phase, the cubic phase for a perovskite, and to look at the possible structural instabilities by simply computing, let's say, the phonon bands of the system. So these are the phonon bands computed for uh, barium titanate in idealized cubic phase of barium titanate that we take, that we consider at zero Kelvin, let's say. 
at zero Kelvin, that phase is, is not stable, and the instability of that phase against a, a big number of distortions actually manifests itself in, uh, in phonon modes with imaginary frequency or negative frequency square. These guys these are imaginary frequencies that we typically represent with negative numbers in this kind of plots. Okay? And I am plotting here varying tightening because varying tightening is very simple and very, very beautiful. So you see here that the gamma point, that means for homogeneous phonons, we have a dominant instability. So this is the phonon with the lowest uh, 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 negative frequency, let's say. Okay, and this is actually the one that is related to the ferroelectric, ferroelectricity in the material. And what you typically don't discuss for varying tightening is that over here, at different points in the Brillouin zone, at some boundary in particular, you have phonons that are, as you can see, they are exactly in the same band as the ferroelectric one. This is simply an anti-modulation of the same dipoles, and these are anti-ferroelectric instabilities, which in barium titanate are not relevant. We don't see them experimentally, but in principle, they are here, okay? The material has it. And so this kind of picture, if we had exactly this material, barium titanate, but with the, with the reversal of the relative stability between this guy and these guys, in other words, if these two phonon frequencies here were lower than this one, this would be an ideal Kittel antiferroelectric in a perovskite, okay? And that's what we are going to be looking for. Now, there is a very uh, usually mentioned uh, antiferroelectric anti perovskite, of course, which is lead zirconite, but lead zirconite is nothing like this. Lead zirconite is very, very complicated, and by no means I think can be considered a model system. Actually, I think it's a, it's a beast on its own. So let's just look at the phonons and see what happens in lead zirconite. If I mark here the antiferroelectric modes of lead zirconite, they are these two phonons here. You have to believe me. The, usual, the one that is relevant, uh, uh, um, actually, in the later experimental is not at the zone boundary, it's in the middle of the ruling zone. But you have here two modes. Those could be the dominant antiferroelectric instabilities that are hidden there. They are not, they are other much stronger instabilities in let's circulate, right? For example, you have the ferroelectric one, is much stronger as an in instability than these two. Okay? Nevertheless, this kind of thing appears. Experimentally, this one doesn't appear. Why? Because in let's circulate, actually, there are even a different set of modes. These are tilts of the oxygen of the oxygen octahedron in the system, which are actually the dominant instability. And what happens in the circuit is that the tilts condense, and when the tilts condense, then something else happens, and eventually the antiferroletic order appears. But as you see, this is very, very complex. Here, the analogy with the antiferromagnets, you know, essentially is non-existent. And this definitely is a, a very nice antiferroletic material, but it's not the kind of model system we are looking for. Okay, so what we did is, let's try to compute these phonon bonds, bands for many perovskites. Uh, in principle, we restricted ourselves to non-magnetic non compounds, just for simplicity, okay? And see whether we can observe some trends or we can learn something. So essentially, we consider compounds here, the ones in purple, so taking as the A cation, uh, an alkali uh, metal here, as the, as the B cation, uh, someone in this column, uh, two, four compounds where you have, you take an alkaline earth and titanium zirconium or hafnium and other compounds. We also consider uh, not only oxides, but also uh, materials in which our anion uh, is, in, is in the column of fluorine, okay? So we consider very many, we put them in the computer and we compute phonon bands. This is just to give you a feeling of the kind of thing that we get. So here you have a table, we are changing the a side cation, which is a, has a balance two plus in all cases and the B side cation, these are our phonon bands. And then we look at them uh, one by one, trying to understand if you had any antiferroelectricity dominating. Here there is nothing, but we didn't do only this. We also did the materials under pressure. So here you can see a figure, very beautiful, I think, picture of, of movie of how the bands evolve as you apply pressure to the system. You can see many interesting things here, but no, not induced antiferroelectricity. We also did epitaxial strain. So then the building zone becomes more complicated because you are reducing the symmetry to the diagonal. We can compute this, make the movies. You see many things. It's not obvious anything becomes antiferroid. Okay. So I've shown you many things, many, many, many. We look at all of them. There is only one material where we saw there can be a hint for this ideal antiferroelectricity I'm talking about. And this material, the first one we found, is cesium vanadate. So if you compare barium titanate with cesium vanadate, what do you observe? Actually, something very similar. There is like an unstable band here, which is also here. It's very similar. This band consists of movements of vanadium in the, in the oxygen octahedra. This band consists of movement of titanium. So it's very similar. And it has one feature. So here we have a very flat band. And we have, we ha here we have an even flatter band where still the gamma point dominates. Okay? 
So does it make sense that cesium vanadide is so similar to barium titanate? Well, it does, because if you think about the periodic table, actually we are moving from barium to cesium, so they are close neighbors, and from titanium to vanadium. So what we are doing is to make a replica of barium titanate, but putting on the A side a cation that is bigger, significantly bigger, cesium, is, cesium 2 plus is significantly bigger than barium 2 plus, and on the B side, we put a cation that is smaller than, than titanium, okay? And indeed, uh, what the, the most important thing actually is that cesium is bigger. If you keep cesium on the A side and you put on the B, on the B side niobium or tantalum, you have a beautiful sequence in which you approach more and more barium titanate. In fact, cesium tantalate is almost a, a copycat of barium titanate at the level of the structural instabilities. Okay? So you can do these tricks, you can play in this case with size effects and really tune the material. Okay, but let's go back to this one. So here we are so close that we thought, shit, we have to figure out something to make these guys lower than this. I mean, you know, we are so close, whatever we do, we should be able to tip this balance. And we had a specific idea which has to do with the epitaxial strength. So essentially, if you think of that material, you have vanadium atoms, you, this is the line of vanadium and oxygen, surrounded by oxygens, and in principle, uh, because this band is so flat, in the cubic phase of the material, vanadium can move up or down, and this vanadium can move in any way totally uncorrelated from the next, because the band is very flat, so you can have pretty much a, a local distortion that doesn't need to correlate with the, with the distortions nearby. Okay? And we said, okay, what if we compress this guy in plane, so essentially the material has to do something to, to, um, to kind of um, uh, gain space as much as it can. This compression in plane, we thought, might be able to induce a backlim. That essentially means that uh, now the we will induce some correlation between vanadiums nearby so that they actually would mate or might prefer to move in an anti-parallel way. So essentially you avoid having vanadiums uh, a bit too close. Okay, so that's what we tried. And uh, just to give you a, a summary of the result here, we, it's the same bands as before, but now we are putting a 1% epitaxial compression in cesium vanadate as we would have if we grow it in an appropriate substrate. And now you see that the bands here have changed a little bit. And if we zoom out, we see that we had a stabilization of the antiferroelectric order. Okay, it's still a very, very flat band, but now modes at X or M, so anti, in antiphase for the dipoles, win over the modes at gamma. Okay, so um, I'm not going to show any more bands, um, and now we are going to go to a study, a study more depth at cesium vanadate. But let me say one thing before, before I move on. We have, of course, a ton of results, and one thing that we want to do now is to analyze all this phonon information in terms of interatomic interactions and try to understand why. Why is it that ferroelectricity, so I should say ferroelectricity here, ferroelectricity wins, no, antiferroelectricity wins in one case, while ferroelectricity, it should say ferroelectricity here, wins in all the cases except one. Okay? And uh, we've been trying to, uh, scratching our heads and trying to come with an explanation that physically makes sense, and I can tell you like in two minutes and everybody learns something, but so far uh, uh, we don't have a convincing story, so maybe that's, that's for the next time, but uh, we are trying to do that, that's in progress. Okay, but for the moment, let's go back to cesium vanadate. Here we have maybe our first antiferro Kitter antiferroelectric telescope. So what is the ground state of cesium vanadate? You have seen the bands, but of course that means that if, yeah, if I am the cubic phase, the first thing the material would like to do is to form dipoles in antiphase, but that doesn't mean that the uh, antipolar phase is the ground state. So how do you find the ground state of a material like this? You can, for example, do the following. You could condense the strongest phonon instability of the cubic phase. You, can, you go back to a, to a minimum, or you go back down in energy, and you check whether that place where you arrive is a minimum. It could be a minimum or a saddle point, if there is some remaining instability. If it is a minimum, you are done. If it is a saddle point, you go back, and once you are there, you condense the strongest instability, and you keep condensing instabilities until you get to a minimum, okay? And you can do that, Starting not only from starting from the cubic phase always, but not only with the strongest instability, but maybe also with the second strongest, because typically you have competing phases and you can have different polymorphs. So if you do that with cesium vanadate, this is very well defined. It sounds good, great. It's very systematic. We use symmetry. It's fantastic. If you do that with cesium vanadate, after five or six or ten instabilities that you keep condensing, which is what we did, we got tired. It was almost impossible to get with it to a minimum. What was happening? that the minimum that we found uh, later is so far away from the cubic phase, is deep, the depth of the minimum is 2.7 electron volt per formula unit, I mean, electron volt, not milli-electron volt. So this is a huge thing. 
is much uh, bigger than, for instance, what you happens in bismuth ferrite or in lithium niobate if you start from, uh, from the cubic phase. And so we are so far that essentially those instabilities I have shown you about the cubic phase don't mean much. Uh, the material uh, really wants to distort the perovskite structure quite a lot. Okay, so how do we find uh, the minimum? So what we did was something a bit uh, more simple-minded, which was to take the whole material in the computer and run a simulated annealing in the computer, you know, in a two by two by two cell, so 40 atoms. Here you have a summary of what we found. You can start reading if you want, but if you look at the movie, this is what we get. So as you see, the perovskite structure distorts quite a lot. Not completely, the cesium atoms still maintain some sort of pseudo perovskite-like uh, lattice. But several things have happened. First of all, you saw there's been a huge distortion along this direction. So this becomes a, a, a material with a very high aspect ratio, actually zero very of the 1.3. So it goes to some sort of super tetragonal phase, which shouldn't scare us because we have seen some things like this in perovskite. Actually, it shares another feature with the super tetragonal phases. If you pay attention, you will see in the next slide better, the octahedra have broken, and they break first to form pyramids with only five oxygen atoms, and then another oxygen atom goes away, and finally they, they form tetrahedra. Okay? So this is typically what you get. From the cubic phase, you can go to phases like this one. And there are many possible phases like this one. Okay? Uh, here is another view. This is, uh, you are going to see simultaneously what happens in the material from two different views. Again, we start from the perovskite structure. So if you have a look at it, here you see, I cannot stop, you see very clearly we have the pyramids, and now another bomb breaks, and we have the tetrahedra. Okay? So we have, we go from vanadium 6 to vanadium 5 to vanadium 4. Okay? Again, I don't think these phases are totally new. And actually, the final thing, which here is this kind of a zigzag configuration of tetrahedra, is very reminiscent. When we saw this, actually, I thought immediately of phases I had already seen for bismuth ferrite. If you put bismuth ferrite on a tensile uh, uh, substrate, it forms, that forces it to go to kind of a super tetragonal phase. It forces, I mean, the, the, the octahedra break. You have pyramids, and they form patterns like this. You can have a look uh, at those in that paper by Logan Velez and collaborators. So this is not so different from what uh, we have seen in other, in, in other perovskites, um, but that's what we obtain in our supposedly antiferroelectric material. Okay. Now, what is very interesting is that these uh, tetrahedra are distorted. So uh, regular tetrahedra, of course, would have no dipole moment, but there is distorted. So there are two short uh, vanadium oxygen distances in this case, two long distances, and there is a dipole. So each of those tetrahedra has a dipole, an electric dipole associated to it. Okay, and then they can appear in many different configurations. We have checked that you can form many different polymorphs that could change depending on how is the short range or mid range order of the tetrahedra. Here you have just three phases that we call zigzag, battlemen, because these guys look like battlemen in, in castles, or rings, beautiful rings. Okay? These are the lowest energy states for many compounds that we studied, all the ones with vanadium. They are competing polymorphs for many, many others, in particular all the ones with cesium. But even regular perovskites like potassium vanadate, which I mentioned here because it will be relevant later, have uh, metastable polymorphs like this. Okay? So now, is this completely crazy? Actually not. Once we discovered this, we went back to the literature and we saw that actually for potassium vanadate, this is the phase that is known and reported in the literature. It has been known since the 50s. So potassium vanadate has this structure. And actually, there has been more recent reports that people have apparently seen this structure for also cesium and rubidium vanadate in bulk materials. This is all in bulk, by the way. Here, there is no epitaxial strain, anything. This happens in bulk. OK. Now, so what about these structures? I told you that the tetrahedra have dipoles. And here you can see in these pictures, I think quite clearly, so if you follow this uh, zigzag uh, pattern of dipoles, you will see that you see here you see the vanadium atom because the apical oxygen is behind it, let's say. But if you follow this, uh, this zigzag, here you see the apical oxygen. Okay? So these two, uh, uh, actually these two uh, uh, zigzag uh, lines have dipoles, and the dipoles along the direction pointing towards you are here pointing towards you and here away from you. Okay? So this is an antipolar structure. And it was very easy for us in the computer to construct the equivalent polar structure, where all the apical, you would see all the apical oxygens. For example, here, you see all the apical oxygens pointing towards you. This is a ferroelectric phase, or it has a, it's a polar phase, not antipolar. Here in the rings, you have something even funnier. If you look at uh, one given ring, in two cases, you see an oxygen pointing towards you. In two cases, you see it uh, away from you. So you here, you have antipolar structure within the ring. Okay. 
So I am marking here the dipoles that point, let's say, away from you. Here you have you are in antiferroelectric phase, potentially. Here you also, and you have a different configuration. But you can have this kind of configuration here also, with pointing towards you, pointing away from you. I mean, you can have essentially all possible combinations, or ferroelectric, antiferroelectric, and ferri-electric structures. You can have anything you want. Now, can they flip? They can flip. So here I, see, I show you another picture, another movie. My postdoc, Hugo, is very much into making movies, beautiful movies. And here you see, we start with our zigzag chains, but now are in a different direction, so they look uh, in a line. Uh, in this case, the uh, apical oxygen are pointing towards you. In this case, this case they are pointing away from you. This structure has zero polarization, but now we are going to make it switch to the, to the corresponding ferroelectric polymer. And pay attention to what happens with this guy, and then what happens with this guy. So here goes the movie. So first, this guy rotates, and the dipole switches. And now you pay attention to this guy. In the second stage, it rotates, and the dipole switches. So we have a very clearly well-defined transition from the antipolar state to the polar state. The switching has to do with the rotation of this tetrahedra. It's like in a, if this was a molecular or you know, in a polymeric, uh, uh, paralytic polymer. Okay. And, uh, and it's really beautiful. So how large is the polarization? Well, the total polarization of the ferroelectric phase you can compute with the ferry based theory. is like this. So you know it's one fourth of that of baryon titanate, so it's not so bad. Here you have in more detail the calculation of that switching procedure. We do this with something called Nash elastic band, which is a standard, standard method to find lowest energy paths in first principles calculations. So we start antiferroelectric. We climb up to a ferry electric state, which is this state where you saw that only half of the, of the tetrahedra have flip, and finally to a ferroelectric state that has a very similar energy. You can monitor the polarization, and this is the polarization that we are switching through this path. By the way, at intermediate stages, you develop a polarization in plane. It all makes sense. Now, you can estimate how this energy changes if, if I apply an electric field, because you have information about the energy of the polarization. So you can construct an electric enthalpy like this and plot the similar curve for different values of the electric field. Of course, this is an approximation, but you can do it. And if you do it, you have here, for different values of the field, uh, which is given, I think, in, uh, in millivolt per centimeter, no, in megavolt per centimeter, I think. So these are huge fields, some of them. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about the units. Don't, you will see that later. But you see that uh, what used to be a minimum here at zero field, if I put a field large enough, I invert, and I get the minimum here in the ferroelectric phase. So if I have all this information, of course, I can try to, try to estimate a, a, a hysteresis loop. So I do it at, at 300 Kelvin. Again, this is approximation. I translate 300 Kelvin as I have enough energy to jump over wells of energy barriers of 0.3 mL per Armstrong cube. And then I got this hysteresis loop. It's beautiful. There is one problem, as probably you have noticed, which is that the fields I need to switch are huge. Now, this is the kind of moment where I'm not sure if it is worth to present the, the result or not, because in first principles, we can do all these things that we have done. But we know from a lot of experience, particularly from the group of Laurent Velez, who has done this kind of switching experiments with effective Hamiltonians over and over again, that our methods overestimate the coercive fields by a lot. When I mean by a lot, if you compare with experiments, it's like things like lead titanate or PCT, the overestimate is by a factor of 20 or 25. There are many reasons why this could be. Our samples are perfect, there are no defects, there are no nucleation centers, you know, you name it. But uh, this is just to tell you, this may sound like totally discouraging. We will never be able to switch this material in the, experiment, in, the, in the laboratory, but I might be overestimating this switching field by a factor of 20 or 25. At least, by the way. The way we do it actually is not as precise as Logan does, and I think we are overestimating even, even more. So don't get too discouraged about that, and if you have this material around, try to switch it, by all means. Uh, and well, to wrap up, I mean, there are more things to say, of course. I told you there are many polymorphs. We believe we should be able to establish the other polymers with epitaxial constraints. We believe with an electric field, the switching I showed you goes from the zigzag antipolar phase to the zigzag ferroelectric phase. But if I put an electric field, I might get up stuck in the, what I'm, call, I'm calling here, battlement ferroelectric phase, which I showed you before. Who knows? There are many things that these guys could, uh, could do to surprise us. If you think, wow, but this uh, vanad vanadium is bad. By the way, the switching experiments I showed you are not for cesium vanadate, they are all for potassium vanadate, which is the one that is actually experimentally known and on which we focus once we learned that actually existed. 
Um, and if you think potassium vanadate is bad because vanadium is going to be leaky, we thought, well, what about mixing it with potassium niobate, which uh, at least we are more familiar with. And of course, if you mix them in a quick calculation, we show that something that you can expect, there is a morphotropic phase boundary in which you go from the zigzag phase to the typical ferroelectric phase of um, potassium neoate. So over here, it might be that you are able to control this is work in progress, the switching barrier, the coercive field. And with an electric field, maybe you would be able to go from a, this one of beautiful phase with the tetrahedra to a perovskite-like phase with octahedra. I mean, in principle, all that could be within reach in this kind of materials. So that's the end of the story. Um, my main message may be that, um, well, as you saw, we wanted to do something very systematic to find uh, kittel antiferroelectrics among perovskites. And for the moment, we have ended up with a material that we still call perovskite derivative, I, because it's not so different from superdetragonal bismuth ferrite, for example, and we call that a perovskite. Maybe, maybe, maybe the name is not adequate. But maybe one important message is that this material actually was known from the 50s. As, as far as we know, nobody had thought, can we switch it? Nobody had realized it was antipolar. So there may be quite a few antiferroelectric among us, and um, we haven't realized. Nevertheless, uh, more specifically, we have studied these three. They could be new antiferroelectric materials. Uh, the switching here, you see, it was multi-step. It, it went through a, through a ferry electric state, but as you see, it's flipping a tetrahedra. So we believe this can be a strongly multi-step. Um, and if you are able to control that experimentally, eventually you can have as many states as you want. And that may be interesting in the context of memory store applications. We know you can tune the coercive fields. And we are I'm convinced you can tune the coercive fields a lot. But for the moment, we know you can do that by changing the composition. As you go towards session, the coercive fields go smaller by at least 20 25%. Uh, so we believe this can be a, a family of exciting antiferroelectrics. Um, well, and by the way, you get huge C over A ratios. All these phases are super tetragonal. And by the way, if you compare with the previous one known, they all contain bismuth or lead. Here, we don't have any lone pair. Lone pairs used to be believed, you know, we believe, I believe at least, that they were important to get these kind of structures. Well, maybe not. So maybe that's also an interesting message. And that's all I have. So thank you for your attention. I think many of these are just pyroxenes, which are one, one, yes. of, the, one of the most common mineral groups in, in the universe, and yes. I did yeah, my okay. thesis on them. Anyway, so it's nice to know they might be uh, related to ferroelectrics. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I forgot to mention <laughs> the name because I keep forgetting it, but yes, absolutely. Well, as we know, the anti-ferroelectric polarization is, is something ill-defined, but uh, it is, would be nice anyhow to see how the, Kittel uh, original picture applies. For instance, when you rotate, I, I, what I will look in this way, when you rotate the chain, uh, the one-year centers, do, do they rotate rigidly with the chain or they move? This would be, because if they move, let's say, if, when you rotate the chain, when your chain centers also go with the chain, that means the concept of Kittel is more or less right. Yeah, I know. I think they rotate with, with, the, with, Rigidly. The, with the rotation. No, they cannot be. Quasi what, the, rigidly. No, the really. centers, because the one is function themselves must be different because they must be orthogonal to the other ones. So when you rotate, uh, the nodes uh, must mm. ma match. But the centers maybe don't move. No, it would be fun, it would be fun to look at that, definitely. Yeah, no, thank you for the thank suggestion. One question. Sorry, I'll get you next. Um, Sorry, as almost the oldest here, I can perhaps add a historical remark because when Kittle's paper came out, uh, Harry Thomas and uh, uh, Cochrane, Bill Cochrane and all those guys were in Zurich and uh, they were discussing whether antiferroelectric is, you know, a common thing or not common thing. And the argument was very simple. I mean, uh, ex uh, the result is the same, but the, the simple argument was oxygen doesn't like a straight bond. If, if perovskites had a straight bond, everything would be antiferroelectric. Mm -hmm. But because they hate straight bonds, they want an angle in the bond, so they're all ferroelectric. And therefore, they said, what you have to do is to go to a completely different geometry, like pyroxenes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Uh, just to say, that was 1970. I mean, your work is wonderful, but I'm just no, saying... Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, actually, <laughs> I, I think somehow we are looking in our data for something like that, right? I mean, yeah. for numerical evidence that something like that happened. A simple, obvious explanation, because there must be one. 
probably that one. All right, just a related question. So uh, why not consider order disorder for electrics as a playground for anti for electrics? Well, indeed, uh, when we look for these very flat uh, bands, essentially that's the, the ultimate order disorder uh, for electric, right? Absolutely. Can so you, I didn't quanti make that can you quantify order doing. disorder transitions the same way you do displacive ones? Quantify what? Uh, well, what displaces, how it displaces, how the interactions occur. Because the parallelectric, the, the central symmetric state is kind of hard to define in that case. Well, yes, of course. I mean, uh, um, theoretically, I mean, at, this, at the level of this approach, you could do something very, very similar. Uh, you would discover that the, that the interactions between neighbors are very weak. So you live in, in deep double well potentials with very weak, and, and all that you can compute. And beyond that, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what kind of question, uh, answer would satisfy you, but you could run then the molecular dynamics, whatever, and you would see that locally, even in the parallelic phase, you could see that the system is in the well, but jumping from time to time and uncorrelated from the rest, right? And, you know, I mean, in, in, the, in the early works of the Fetty Hamiltonians, uh, uh, when, when Vanderbilt and company were doing a baryon titanate, they, they quantified this. Baryon titanate is not, I mean, it's essentially, it's a little bit order disorder, I would say, as compared with other things. But they could see this kind of um, this kind of distribution uh, above the transition temperature. So, and yeah, you can modify that. Uh, could you comment um, about the simulated annealing technique that uh, that, that you're using? And yeah. this, and the second question is: uh, uh, Is it really necessary to have uh, your phonon frequencies at the x and the m points to be lower? So, as I understand, antiferroelectrics, you need to have your polar and antipolar phases which is like very close in energy. Yes. So, uh, I mean, if... Well, uh, yeah, sure, yeah. I understand. First question, I don't remember the stack details. In those uh, annealings, probably we started at 1,000 Kelvin, so things would agitate and then quench very quickly. I don't know for how long do we run that. I mean... Oh, is it like a Monte Carlo? No, simulation? we did molecular dynamics. Molecular, okay. Uh, by uh, velocity rescaling, you know, and, and quenching. I mean, whatever is implemented in, in VASP, I, we didn't do anything fancy. Okay. And about the second question, uh, you essentially need uh, these two phases. I mean, of course, the phonon, the phonon band structure doesn't tell you which one of these two phases is lower in energy. You would need to analyze both of them separately and make sure that the antiferroelectric one is lower than the ferroelectric one. Right? So you, you cannot know that from the phonon band structure. So actually, I mean, beyond certain closeness, it's probably preposterous to continue because, you know, you don't know which one will be lower ultimately. I mean, you, by, uh, by lower, you mean the antipolar phase, and then you check if the antipolar and the polar are by, closing. By Once I have phonons like that, yeah. I have to construct the, I have to condense the phonons and look for local minima that are corresponding to the ferroelectric state okay. and the antiferroelectric state. And I have to compare the energies of these two local minima. Mm -hmm. so okay. If the antiferroelectric one is the, no, not only the local, but the global, then I am in business. If not, not. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again because we're okay. got a. Oh.